So welcome to our next edition of Bilateral Bites. I'm Tanya Spisbar, the Director of the Australia India Institute here in India. And today we're discussing the new global order, strategic partnerships in a shifting Indo-Pacific with the National General Secretary of the BJP. Mr. Ram, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, so Mr. Ram Madhav is also on the board of directors of the India Foundation, which will be hosting the Australia and Indian High Commissioners next week to be discussing the Leaders' Summit uh, that has just taken place between the Australian and Indian Prime Ministers. Now, Mr. Ram, as a thought leader uh, on the New Global Order yourself, you've noted the axis of power shifting from the Pacific Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific. As the 20th century powers and alliances have shifted, you've also spoken of the need for new alliances and new institutions in the 21st century to reflect those changes. With the weakening 20th century institutions being even more apparent during the COVID time, I wanted to ask your opinion on alliances. So yesterday, of course, Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Morrison had an excellent discussion and demonstrated their great friendship, discussing Skamosas and Kichiri and the like. Um, but it was also a very serious and significant discussion, concluding defence agreements and specifically the, mutual, uh, the mutual logistics support agreement uh, for reciprocal access to our military bases and logistical support as well. Why, in India's perspective, is Australia such a good and strong strategic defence partner in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, firstly, uh, it came late but uh, it finally happened yesterday. <laughs> Meeting between our two prime ministers was to take place early this year, in January this year, for various reasons. First in Australia, subsequently because of the COVID uh, crisis, this meeting got delayed, but finally it took place yesterday. We are very happy about the outcome. You see, we are living in a totally different geopolitical situation in the 21st century. This mm -hmm. realization has to dawn on all the countries today. It's no longer the uh, geopolitical reality of the 20th, 20th century anymore. 21st century geopolitical reality is going to be markedly different from that of the last century. In the 21st century, the global power axis has shifted away from the Pacific Atlantic uh, region to our own neighborhood, the Indo-Pacific region. It is this region which is the most happening region today. Incidentally, countries like Australia and India are a very important and integral part of this new, most happening, most powerful region of the world today. We have had great power rivalries in the last 100 years, or last 70 years, or 80 years post the Second World War. We are still attuned to big power politics in the world. I believe the 21st century belongs to middle powers. Mm. Middle powers, when I say, I'm talking about countries like India, Japan, Australia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, South Korea, uh, even you go to Europe, countries like France, England. It is these countries that have to now come forward to, a, to play a proactive role. As far as our own region, our own neighborhood is concerned, which is this Indo-Pacific region, India and Australia have a greater role to play for various reasons. Most importantly, we are maritime neighbors. We mm -hmm. both share the same Indian Ocean waters. Although many people call uh, Australia is, as a Pacific Ocean country, I would remind them that Perth is still on the Indian Ocean side. So Australia is both an Indian Ocean country as well as a Pacific Ocean country. We share uh, uh, many different values. We are both strongly wedded to democracy. We have uh, uh, a very strong common interest in keeping our region, this Indo-Pacific region, as peaceful, as inclusive, as prosperous, as secure. It's our 
common interests. We have certain commonwealth history. We both were colonized nations which came out of colonization and became independent. We are thriving market economies. No, no better bilateral arrangement can be seen in this region than an arrangement between our two countries. That is why I feel that whatever happened yesterday, especially of upgrading of our bilateral relations to comprehensive strategic partnership, is a very difficult thing. It is going to play a very vital role in the coming years and decades. I couldn't agree more, and thank you very much for that um, brilliant outline. Um, I'm also of the view that the 21st century necessarily has to belong to middle powers and the countries that you outlined um, indeed already have a web of relationships among them. I wanted to bring you to um, an observation you made back in Sochi a couple of years ago that there are new alliances in the leadership of civilization states which include China and Russia. And noting that India joined the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, just in 2017, I wanted to ask you your view of China in particular as a, um, as a strategic partner or a trade partner, given the recent uh, reactions of China, both to the coronavirus and coronavirus inquiry in the World Health Organization and the reaction of the world. And in addition, China's uh, increased aggression on the border of India. China is definitely uh, one of the big powers in the world today. Mm. It has mm. economic heft. It has uh, spread its influence through its trade and economic activities on a wide range of uh, countries in the world. It is today are in a position to compete with the other superpower in the world, namely America. US and China relations are going to decide about the future of geopolitics in the world in this century. In other words, whether we like it or not, I would say it is very unfortunate, but a sort of a new Cold War-like situation is mm -hmm. emerging in the world today. In that sense, we, as you very rightly mentioned, the middle powers, which are no longer small, together we are a very strong force. We together contribute to 60% of the global GDP, we must remember. Yes. If you take together these middle powers that I mentioned, important countries, we are a very significant force. It is uh, up to us to ensure that the new Cold War-like situation that is unfolding does not impact our geostrategic interests, geopolitical interests, and geoeconomic interests. That is the biggest challenge that all of us face. So it is no longer like, you know, uh, in the last century when we had the Cold War-like uh, uh, politics between USA and the USSR, there was uh, this luxury of having a third group which was a non-aligned movement. We used to call yes. it non-aligned. Today we do not probably have that kind of a luxury that you will sit at home saying that you doesn't belong to this camp or that camp. Today, we also we all have to actively come together to tell these two powers that look, the region in which we are all living, especially countries like Australia and India, we must understand that this new Cold War is going to be played out in our own backyard, in our own neighborhood, mm -hmm. cannot be uh, excluded or less impacted by it. So we have to tell these powers that you have to work in a manner that would help us because this yeah. region has stakes for China, has stakes for America also. We, many of our countries have alliances with all these, do, all the, uh, both the big powers. So the new scenario calls for a very restrained behavior by civilizational nations like China and superpowers like America. The challenge before all of us, the middle powers, is to ensure that these two big powers in their uh, rivalry or in their competition they do not become a big uh, 
challenge or a big problem for all of us in the region. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And this concept of a Cold War emerging is an interesting one. There have been comments that, in a way, the current situation between the United States and China differs from the situation between the United States and the former USSR, because in that setting, in the original Cold War, the two forces or the two major economies were less involved or integrated with one another. They were economically relatively separate and therefore continuing a Cold War between those two nations was quite different. Here, commentators are starting to talk about a Cold War 1.5 because the two parties at play are in fact heavily embedded one in, in one another, both in terms of economic um, investment, global supply chains, even the Apple phone, you know, is components are made in China and assembled there. <clears throat> so a lot of um, the US economic identity in terms of the manufactured products are also in China, making it very challenging to, um, to try and disentangle or decouple themselves. You've spoken about this, this um, situation developing and the need for middle power cooperation. Just going now to the types of cooperation that we currently have, the Quad, and you know, Australia left uh, because they were concerned about China antagonism and now has joined because it's um, concerned about the need to balance China's uh, influence in the Indo-Pacific region. So we have a quadrilateral of Japan, Australia, uh, India and the United States. Given the recent developments and the United States' own aggressive behaviour, how, how is um, the US viewing the United States now? And would there be merit in a similar grouping that might not include either China or the US? So perhaps in fact, a strategic cooperation between India, Japan, Australia, Indonesia, South Korea, Singapore, France, Singapore, for example. Uh, oh yes, in fact, as I mentioned uh, in my uh, previous comments, mm. uh, especially about the Indo-Pacific region today, we all have to think in a very out-of-the-box way and in a very innovative way. Uh, we, as countries of this region, starting from Australia to Indonesia to Malaysia to Singapore to India to Vietnam to South Korea to Japan, we are all geographically located in this region. So is China. China has its own influence in this region and beyond. So is United States, which has important bilateral arrangements with countries like Australia, countries like Singapore, countries like, I mean, almost all, all the important countries in the region, like Japan, uh, South Korea, they all have important uh, strategic arrangements with the, the uh, United States. Interestingly, less uh, uh, acknowledged fact is countries like UK and France, they too have major stakes in the Indo-Pacific region, especially in the Indian Ocean region. As far as France is concerned, it has got its own uh, territories in the Indian Ocean region. Yes, yeah, several islands, yeah. including Caledonia, absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, even UK has huge interest in this region. So the most happening region in 21st century, for it to be secure, countries in the region have to come together. Quad is one arrangement, we have it, but we should go beyond Quad. ASEAN is a very important peg in this arrangement. Together with ASEAN, countries from Japan to Australia, including India, we all have to work together. But in this, we also have to welcome countries like France and UK to join us. Together, we should be able to manage the affairs of this region. But again, I'm saying, on one side is China, which has vast influence. And today, including India, every country's economy, you have talked about the interlocking of economies between China and the and America. Yeah. Same is the case with Australia and China. Same is the case with India and China. India and Absolutely. China have a hundred billion dollar bilateral trade. And in, in your Australia's case, it is two hundred billion dollar. So we are economically interlinked so it's a Absolutely. very 
it's an important scenario that is unfolding so we have to on one hand manage our relations with the us on the other hand china in that we the stakeholder countries have to come together so that you know these um, obama's famous phrase of asian rebalance obama used to think president obama used to think that it is america's responsibility i would say it is the responsibility of the countries in the region to ensure there is asian rebalance here i wholeheartedly agree again and it is interesting to me that for the quad every single member is actually dependent on china for each one of us for the united states for japan for india and for australia china is the number one trading partner for each of us so there is certainly a very he heavy um reliance on that relationship currently one thing that i really take away from yesterday's summit though is the concept of shared values so one thing i've noticed as a diplomat in india and now as my role as director is that india seeks to increase its influence but it does so in a um in a way that works with economies for mutual benefit so india's approach with the africa union with uh the middle east and the gulf you know stretching to west asia um into central asia becoming part of the uh, the shanghai cooperation organization with the central asian economies as well and with asean all these relationships are actually about exercising influence through um mutual benefit mutual gain and cooperation in the case of the united states and of china the 20th century hegemonic mentality seems to be more at at play so there's economic coercion economic aggression responses with the rising of tariffs or sanctions so the, these things to me also go towards the values of a state and how a state interacts um with its other with its other neighbors in the region and the world so in my view the the middle powers grouping that you were talking about each share these values of engaging with one another um on a respectful basis rather than through a coercive basis so that to me is the distinction between how the two major superpowers are behaving this segues into the other point i wanted to make and again refers to one of your comments made at sochi you said for the 21st century both alliances and also institutions need to change in the 21st century so we've discussed alliances but on institutions you described the um 20th century institutions and by that i take to mean the united nations institutions the bretton woods institutions and the world trade organization as having um you know been made of exclusivism and exceptionalism uh making it difficult for the developing countries can i just ask what you what you mean by those things in what way are these institutions exclusive when i said that the 21st century geopolitical reality is going to be different from the 20th century reality what yeah. i meant was the western uh, uh, the global institutions that were largely the outcome of the experience of the second world war were largely uh, centered around the western reality the american reality america was driving the major development in the western world the institutions that took shape in that kind of a geopolitical situation were largely west centric today when the power axis has shifted to a different region namely the indo pacific region the composition of those institutions has to undergo a change but unfortunately mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to be happening so we all have to work towards either restructuring those institutions to represent the new reality in a big way for example uh, countries like india still don't find a place in uh, the security council i mean uh, we uh, we have greater role to play countries like australia have greater role to play countries like japan have greater role to play unfortunately uh, such a reality is no not there at this juncture so we need to restructure these these institutions and especially the covid has taught us that uh, the global institutions especially institutions like the world health organization have not been helpful 
to the extent that they are expected to be helpful to the countries mm. large large uh, number of countries today have uh, uh, complaints about the way the who has conducted itself there is a need for restructuring all these institutions having said it i have to mention one major difference between us and china as far as your comments uh, go sure. china is now an integral part of this region it's it's a, a, a part geographically a part of our region china has to uh, review its uh, its policies its actions to suit the new reality you know these days we all hear about wolf warrior diplomacy the the aggression that we notice in the chinese trade and bilateral relations is probably not helping of course the bilateral relations are multilateral relations in the world it also is not helping china itself there is a huge trust deficit that china is facing today from a large number of countries it is in the interest of of course the region but also it is also in the interest of china that it uh, reviews and restructures its approach to countries in its immediate neighborhood and also in the larger world yeah i couldn't agree more and again i think the trust deficit that you just spoke of is in fact going to harm china's economic interests greatly as countries post covid actually look to um shift a lot of their global supply chains outside of china and to other countries i think japan spent part of its stimulus package for example on repatriating companies back from china to japan or even to other countries to get them out of china um so certainly um that is going to be an impact i think on china and a price that it pays for the trust deficit um your interesting comments on institutional reform i i take them very well i think composition does need to be reviewed and i think that has been agreed whether or not it's happening is a different question but i do think that there is an understanding even since 2017 onward that um multilateral institutions require reform there are a number we're talking about the world health organization reform of course and strengthening who investigative powers clearly india will have a strong role to play having just been um unanimously nominated chair of the executive board uh, so i think we have minister harsh bardan now who will have a strong role to play within the who and then of course we have the the chief health officer as well somia swaminathan as um uh, also in the who when it comes to reform not just in terms of composition but also the rules obviously the world trade organization is undergoing reform as well i understand that india having a very strong interest now in global supply chains and how make in india can can certainly um benefit from global supply chains what kind of reforms would india be looking for at the wto level do you think Uh, look uh, uh, at a rules based level and yeah. which, the extent to which these institutions have today become less attractive to countries in the world can be gauged from one reality tanya mm -hmm. uh, the world trade organization is unable to host important committees for the lack of quorum since 2017 can you imagine Uh, any worse situation than that that itself shows that these institutions are increasingly becoming irrelevant because the global reality has changed and these these institutions are not realizing that i would probably pending the reform of uh, these institutions i would probably recommend that in the indo pacific region we should be able to come up with new arrangements in fact i would as a personal view please don't take it as the view of the indian government but as a personal view as somebody who watches this whole development uh, in the region closely i would even go to the extent of recommending that why not we have uh, um, a kind of an india indo pacific uh, uh, nations parliament here on the lines of european commission or european union 
why not we have indo pacific union here so that we can decide about how to manage the affairs in the indo pacific region it's okay we need not have to have a common currency for example asean group of nations do not have a common currency but 10 countries came together they are a solid block today then why not we think in terms of having a larger uh, arrangement here so we need to think about regional institutions also in order for that's us to really, create an asian rebalance here sure that's a really interesting idea but i guess the most obvious question in response to that is well then why not asep how how would asep not be a beginning or building block towards that end uh, asep is a very very important arrangement in the region i would say mm -hmm. that asep is the 21st century market it is the real market that is in the 21st century that is rcep today india was one of the first participants in the negotiations for the rcep however towards uh, the in, in the final stages of it we could not find certain arrangements acceptable to us india mm. is a big country with a very big market its uh, potential uh, its market potential has not been fully appreciated by some of the countries uh, in the rcep grouping especially i am talking about china certain arrangements in rcep are not uh, uh, to the status and uh, to the acceptance of uh, india's market so india's uh, 600 million strong uh, uh, middle class market force is a is a is a very important segment in rcep in fact uh, uh, we were we, because of lack of uh, appreciation of this reality of importance of indian market uh, by countries like china that we had to to stay out of the rcep and that has led to a very peculiar situation in the indo pacific region you can still create an rcep but without india can that be a comprehensive arrangement rcep is a comp supposed to be a comprehensive one but mm. minus india will it be comprehensive is a big question mark so we need to do, look at it uh, once again uh, within india i am one of those persons who is uh, of the view that we should renegotiate it we should not completely leave it because rcep is going to be the uh, 21st century's major alliance major trade and uh, economic alliance in the world we have to relook at it but as long as india's markets uh, uh, concerns or market status is not appreciated by countries like china it makes uh, mm. it difficult for india to get in no, I take your point and I particularly like the idea, can it be comprehensive? So we either need India or we need to drop the C and make it rep. <laughs> Let's see. Um, your, your earlier point about the composition of international institutions, it seems that India is making great gains under Prime Minister Modi to try and redress this issue. In recent years, um, India has become an institution maker not necessarily a rules maker yet, still a rule taker, but becoming a rule influencer, but an institution maker in the sense of having formed the International Solar Alliance, and then more recently, the Coalition for Dis uh, Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. So both international organizations, both focused on climate change, another 21st century issue, both focused on infrastructure and then renewable energy, two other major issues, and, and both that will have great benefits for the global south. Um, so really demonstrating leadership there. Um, in addition to that, Prime Minister Modi was one of the most active leaders during the COVID crisis, having called the SARC meeting and pledging $10 million very early on to make sure that testing could be done in the region, having um, requested of Saudi Arabia that the extraordinary G20 summit be held virtually, which has gone on to generate the series of ministerial G20 summits as well and very good leadership in anticipation of the 2022 hosting by India. We mentioned the World Health Organization participation at increasingly senior levels, though of course not the Director General level, and 
you made a very good point about the permanent uh, membership on the UN Security Council, but of course India has been a non-permanent member before, and it's likely or at least possible that you, um, India will be the UN Security Council non-permanent member again for 2021, 2022, and has already developed very good support in that direction. So given India's global leadership, and it's really, it's really moving into quite an international stage, not just an Indo-Pacific one, but more broadly, how does this fit with the concept of a self-reliant India as well, this Atmanirbha Bharat concept? Um, I mean, my understanding is it's a self-reliant India in order to um, build from the ground up, build from a sense of, of pride and then share. But it would be interesting to understand from your perspective, both from an institutional one, as well as a trade and supply chains one, what a self-reliant India means and how it connects to these broader Indo-Pacific and global goals. Atma Nirbhar Bharat, self-reliant India, should not be misunderstood as though India is shutting its doors to outside investment or outside interference in Indian economy. That is far from the reality. We yeah. know that in the post-COVID world, there are going to be new global agenda items coming up. You know, I believe that in the post-COVID world, the pre-COVID global agenda items will take a back seat. That includes so-called security issues, so-called mm. uh, trade issues, so-called economic issues, which used to be the main issues of global agenda will take a back seat. In their place are going to come forward issues like climate change, environmental issues, healthcare, Absolutely. technology. Artificial intelligence is going to be, robotics is going to be a new uh, area of massive influence. Uh, democratic values, liberal democracies, uh, or rather I would put it as rule-based world order. These are the new agenda items to dominate the world. And let me tell you, in all these items, India is destined to be an important player. Whether it is uh, healthcare or uh, no, or it is technology, artificial intelligence, IT, or it is uh, you know rule-based world order, or it is as you rightly mentioned non-conventional energy sources, climate change leadership. India is already way ahead. So there is no question of India shutting itself up from the rest of the world. What we mean by Atmanirbhar Bharat is only this much that for India to really become I mean, reality to be capable of playing that uh, important role in the world, it has to actually have uh, its uh, economic foundations strong. It has to build strong economic foundations for itself. I today can tell you, I mean, if I give you some examples, you will laugh at me. India produces world-class uh, textiles for jeans that everybody wears in the world. But mm -hmm. we don't produce chips for jeans. We import gift for jeans from China or Vietnam. So we can produce the, the cloth for jeans. We can't produce jeans because we don't have the gyps. So these are the kind of situations. We produce, we manufacture today $260 billion worth of mobile phones. But 90% of the components we import from outside and assemble them. So I'm just giving, there are umpteen number of examples. So what we decided was that let India build a strong economic base in the country. That is what is Atma Nirbhar Bharat, self-reliant India. But then to create global brands for India, not to shut India from outside world, rather mm -hmm. to, become a create, to create global brands to rise as a strong economic power to, to help the world powers. So, uh, in fact, uh, between India and Australia also, there is huge scope for bilateral trade to grow in our two, between our two countries. It is very small now. It is $20, $30 billion right now. It has a massive scope for uh, you know taking it to next higher levels. India is very much open to all such trade initiatives. In fact, we have opened up our uh, uh, mining sector. 
we have opened up our defense sector we have opened up many other pharmaceuticals and other sectors in india for massive foreign investments so in all these areas we are going to have major cooperation with australia in fact some of the agreements that were signed yesterday include mm. uh, you know uh, expert uh, expertise exchange on uh, mines and minerals and all those areas true. yeah no, very true. And, and your point about India being a leader in climate change, we spoke about the International Solar Alliance, but also your very ambitious um, domestic solar energy targets. Um, health, obviously, India has already been very well known as the generic pharmaceutical exporter of the world. Um, but now, increasingly in digital health, in medical technologies as well, and increasingly going to be in medical tourism, obviously in medical um, services and skills, exporting nurses and the like as well. Um, in technology, obviously IT has been a, um, a real backbone of Indian capability and one of the first um, multinational companies to go offshore, in fact, are, are in the IT sector. And as we turn to AI, robotics, ICT, 5G, India will certainly be a very significant player. And again, those technologies will impact the others that we just spoke about. So. ICT and, um, and 5G will clearly impact health and, and any other technology dependent transport, any other technology dependent sector. Um, so no, I, I do agree with, with all of that and it's been a really interesting uh, conversation about that and understanding how self-reliant India plays into that bigger picture. The one question I want to leave with you last, India is certainly preparing very well for the G20 uh, 2022 will be the 75th year of India's independence and it's a very interesting time. It celebrates um, India's independence from, you know, a previous hegemon and it's interesting to me that India, of all the countries in the world in existence today, has probably the most experience in dealing with a Cold War-like relationship. Prime Minister Modi clearly spoke at NAM this year for the first time in his prime ministership, which has more than 100 member countries and is a significant body in and of itself. Even if people question what are they not aligned from, it's still important to have that principle of uh, for what reason am I cooperating? Is it in the national interest or is it because of an established ally? So I think this non-alignment movement concept among middle powers to preserve multipolarity now that it has emerged is a good one. Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Morrison were both invited to the G7 last year by France, uh, by President Macron, and again this year by the United States. There's been talk of a, of a G, um, G10 with South Korea. Obviously the United States has spoken of including Russia as well. In your view, would this be a positive development, moving from a G7 of, of the rich countries to a slightly broader group? Or would a group that excludes China play into this, this Cold War effect, given we already have the G20? What are your, your views on that? India is, uh, uh, is considering the invitation extended by President Trump for this year's uh, uh, G7 yeah, meeting. As Morrison did, they, yeah. They obviously become G11 now. With uh, the four countries invited to participate, it will become G11. Uh, India has not yet taken a decision about what to do. Uh, the government will announce it uh, soon. But a more structured arrangement, which has been there for a very long time, is the G20 arrangement. We yeah. are uh, very keen on hosting it uh, two years from now in India. So we are preparing for it. We are uh, we are very active participants in a number of such arrangements. You know, as you also mentioned earlier, we are there in Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We are there in G20. We attended G7 last time when France invited us. Uh, so we participated, as you rightly said, Prime Minister spoke at the NAM summit. We are actively participating in Commonwealth. It's a different matter. I have my own opinion about NAM and Commonwealth. I see them as arrangements of the last century. New century should have new arrangements. But pending that, all types of global arrangements where we can cooperate with the rest of the world, we are willing and active participants in those alliances. So uh, that, that will continue. But I still feel that G20 has its own importance, its own significance, 
because G20 is an arrangement which has both the so-called strong, I mean, both the two superpowers, but strong okay. economy together with a number of middle countries, middle economies also as uh, partners in that. It's a more viable arrangement. I think we should go ahead with the G20 with much more seriousness. And it certainly keeps that sense of balance and representation. Um, and India to me seems to be playing a very strong role as it really has done since the inception, since independence of both global leadership and a proud supporter and defender of the, um, the values and needs of the global south as well. And G20 seems to allow both to fit together, that you can be both a, a global leader and the global south um, without needing to decide between the two. So thank you so much for your time. I think that's been a very rich discussion. We've covered a lot of ground, probably in about 45 minutes. Um, and I think what it does is underscore also the importance of Australia and India and the fact that we are in fact grappling with similar issues, forging similar relationships. Both of us have strong bilateral relationships, for example, with France, particularly in defence and, and strategic, which comes through defence technology arrangements as well. And I think we'll be seeing an even more, you know, comprehensive future, not just of um, strategic engagement, but also of friendship. So thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you, Rania. It was great to be back with you.